With the coronation coming up, I thought it would be a good idea to talk through a few coronation portraits. Now, I haven't received my invitation to the coronation yet, but nevertheless, I am ready. Now, these paintings are not the real deal, obviously, but the prints do give me an excuse to talk you through some of the key elements and symbolism that are common to almost all coronation portraits. This portrait, for example, is of Richard II, and it's the first known coronation portrait that we have in the UK. It's currently hanging in Westminster Abbey, which has been the home to every coronation ceremony since 1066. Richard II was crowned in 1377, and I think you get a feel of that date from the portrait. It's quite formulaic. He looks like a fully fledged adult. What you perhaps don't realize is that when he was crowned, he was only 10, which is not the impression you would be given from this portrait, where they've even given him a little beard to make him look a little bit more adult than he in fact is. This portrait is all crimson and gold. Of course, we think of gold as being incredibly expensive, but looking at red, we don't necessarily think of it in terms of how much it would have cost. A crimson like this was produced using Kermes, a tiny, tiny beetle that would be crushed up. Now imagine the amount of these insects you would need to create enough pigment to dye that quantity of fabric. It would be incredibly expensive. And look at the way it's flowing in all of those folds just to show how much of it there is. Elizabeth I was crowned in 1559. And what I love about this portrait is it's all about power. And that's probably because Elizabeth is a Tudor and she understands the importance of branding. You will see that this mantle she's wearing is brocaded with silver Tudor roses. Now, the Tudor rose is so iconic and so immediately recognisable, even centuries later. But what I love about this is that she's filling the whole picture plane. Even as a very tiny woman, I mean, just look at the size of that waist. She's able to show herself as somebody who is taking up space and really in a powerful pose. She's creating a space and a barrier around herself. Then with her mantle, which is completely ermine lined, it's cloth of gold. And that fabric is made from real gold threads. It's just fabulous. She's also holding the orb and scepter, which are a reminder with that cross of the fact that she has been chosen by God to be the monarch. Now, for the Tudors, again, to go back to that branding, their image is so important because they are justifying their very slightly tenuous claim to the throne. Our third coronation portrait is of George III and it was painted in 1761. Now the prime version of this portrait is in fact full length and is in the Royal Collection today. Um, this one, which is in the National Portrait Gallery, is one of a number of replicas and copies. In his portrait, he's chosen to go for a more relaxed pose, a, about as relaxed as you can be as a royal. He's looking away to the side, he's leaning casually on a pedestal there. Again, we've got a huge amount of cloth of gold. But I think more than that, it's the ermine that strikes you. Now, ermine is created from the pelts of a very small marten that had a coat that turned white uh, in wintertime. Those black parts are the very tip of its tail, which is the only part of its coat that doesn't change color. Now, the more black tails you have, the more black spots in your ermine, the more pelts you've used. So it's a status symbol, having as many of those spots as possible. And what I love is when you compare it to the earlier portrait of Elizabeth, George's is so much more naturalistic. You can see the way that the light falls on all of that fur, on the individual strands of hair. He's taken such care to show you exactly how sumptuous this fabric is. That pomp and that splendor is all part of the display to show your birthright and show that this is what you've been born for.